with that uh, having been uh, said, uh, we continue on with the Norman Geisler sermon from, uh, I believe it was 2001 or 2002, uh, I think it was 2001, uh, I believe it was the Fort Lauderdale Calvary Chapel, actually, uh, if I'm recalling correctly, but it's uh, why I'm not a five-point Calvinist, and obviously many of the same issues that uh, come up in Chosen But Free respond to in the Potter's Freedom but people find it useful when we take the time to uh, take apart these statements point by point and demonstrate that even folks with uh, big names and uh, have done good work in other areas, for some reason, when it comes to that one point of man's will and man's control of salvation, uh, all that good work done in other areas goes flying out the window. Equivocation becomes the name of the game. And uh, misrepresentation becomes the result. So let's continue on with where we left off with Dr. Norman Geisler, why he's not a five-point Calvinist. I find that nowhere in the New Testament. Everywhere I find the opposite, that we believe in order to receive salvation. We do not receive salvation in order to believe. As you may recall, unless you didn't listen to the last program, which I only got blogged this morning anyways, uh, we had pointed out that Dr. Geisler is engaging in equivocation. That is, he is uh, identifying regeneration and salvation as the same thing in different contexts, uh, thereby confusing and misrepresenting the Reformed position uh, that uh, regeneration is uh, something that is necessary so that one might have, be freed from the tyranny and slavery of sin and uh, might do what is good and proper uh, in God's sight, and that repentance and faith are things that are good and proper in uh, God's sight. And uh, again, we, we are listening carefully. Will Dr. Geiser address those key biblical texts, which are so supportive of the Reformed position and, and so uh, impossible to interpret in the synergistic uh, Semi-Pelagian, Arminian, whatever, all the groups you want to throw into synergism, they all have slight differences from one another, but uh, his Arminian moderate Calvinism, <laughs> moderate Calvinism, i.e. Arminianism, same thing, uh, pretty much, um, is he going to address those texts uh, and give us a meaningful exegesis? Well, we'll keep listening, and, and uh, you keep a note, uh, you know, if you're taking notes. So will Dr. Geisler address those texts which say that the natural man is not capable of doing what is pleasing to God, cannot submit himself to the law of God? Uh, how about the nature of faith as, as a gift? What about man's deadness in sin and his, what Jesus' own statement, that no one is able to come to me unless the Father sent me draws him? Will he explain those things? So well, how do you explain the fact that they're dead? The Bible says that we're dead in trespass and sins. Dead can be understood two ways. Annihilation uh, or separation. Now, we know in the Bible, death is not understood as annihilation, that you're totally taken right out of existence, as it were. Death in the Bible means separation. The prophet said, your sins have separated you from your God. Death brings a wall of separation. When we die, what happens? The soul separates from the body, absent from the body, present with the Lord, 2 Corinthians 5. It's far better to depart and be with Christ, Philippians 1, 23. Or in the book of Genesis, it says uh, she was die her soul was in the process of departing before she died. So death is understood in the Bible as separation, not annihilation. Oh, uh, hold on just a second here. Uh, we just heard yet another excellent example of how you can speak the truth, but put it in the wrong context to make it an untruth. Because what was just presented was one of the ways that the Bible refers to physical death is to discuss the concept of separation of that spiritual element of man from the physical body. And that is true. But then what happens is you get this leap to the conclusion that this is what the Bible always says about death. And was that substantiated by any of the texts that were cited or the commentary thereon? Well, of course not. It wasn't even addressed. It wasn't even an attempt to, to build that bridge. 
and say that, well, since there's these texts that talk about physical death in this way, that means all the, ta- the texts that talk about spiritual death have the same meaning. That it just means a, a separation from God. It doesn't follow uh, that the person is actually incapable of doing certain things, even though, as we'll see, these texts that talk about spiritual death are then always connected to this, this inability, this incapacity to do what is right before God as, as a result. And so, uh, once again, if you could just stop speakers, you know, and <laughs> have a pause button and analyze the argument and go, well, okay, maybe, but what your, you know, the application seems to involve a real leap here, a real jump uh, in, in logic that doesn't necessarily follow. But for all practical purposes, the five point Calvinist understands it as spiritual annihilation. That's untrue. It's simply untrue. Dr. Geisler has been corrected on this. He refuses to accept correction, uh, but it is a misrepresentation and a demonstration that uh, his tradition overrides uh, simple truthfulness in representation of the Reformed position. That we're not uh, spiritually there in any sense of the term. We can't even understand the message or receive the message, and so God has to give life where we were totally as it were, uh, departed uh, from him. Well, you know, uh, when the Bible utilizes uh, language such as the valley of the dry bones, and there you have the picture of the Spirit of God coming upon those dry bones, and they come together to form bodies, and, and life is brought back to them, or uh, the other picture of uh, the, the heart of stone being turned into the heart of flesh, those are, are fairly radical uh, pictures. They are biblical pictures. Uh, they are prophetic. They are inspired. And uh, in nowhere uh, does that mean that there was spiritual annihilation. Uh, but what it does say is that there is total slavery to sin in light of Jesus' own statements in John 8 where he says, He who sins is a slave of sin. And when Jesus speaks of this kind of slavery, which, by the way, if you're going to you know, be even trying to accurately represent what Reformed people say, you're, you're going to you know, allow them to speak with themselves and recognize uh, that the spiritual death of which we speak is intimately connected to this concept of slavery. Jesus then goes on to say that because they are slaves to sin, that they are not able to hear. They are not able to hear the word of God. They are not able to do things. They have, they, they have resultant inabilities due to the depth of their spiritual death. That is, lack of spiritual life. And yes, it does involve a disconnectedness, a separation from God. Uh, but it also then has an impact, an impact upon the mind, their their foolish minds become darkened. Their speculations, their reasonings uh, are, are in error. And the will as well, because the will acts upon the desires presented to it. And since that person has fallen and is separated from God, then the desires that are, are presented to the will uh, do not include godly desires. Now, all of this, of course, goes against the libertarianism of uh, uh, Dr. Geisler and many others, William Lane Craig, all very much dedicated to this uh, unbiblical concept of libertarianism, which they then use uh, to overthrow meaningful biblical exegesis. But uh, the reality is that we believe that man's soul, man's spirit, uh, remains uh, fully intact, however, uh, fully under the condemnation of sin, fully under the sway of sin, slavery of sin, uh, and uh, as Paul himself said, those who are according to the flesh cannot please God. Those who are according to the flesh cannot submit themselves to the law of God. They cannot please God. This is an inability. As Jesus himself said, they are unable to come to me unless the Father who sent me draws them. Uh, so uh, these are biblical statements of inability, uh, but... Uh, the other side will always speak of hypothetical capacities based upon exhortations. Uh, and so they have to overthrow the plane on the basis of the hypothetical. This is the, the nature of 
uh, synergistic Arminian eisegesis rather than uh, exegesis. No, the Bible says that death is separation from God and that we are separated as beings still in his image and likeness. In Genesis 9-6, it says that even unsaved people are still in the image of God. Now, of course, uh, Reformed people do not say uh, that man has lost the image of God. Now, remember, this, is, this, this sermon is given after uh, the Potter's Freedom has been published, and I specifically in the Potter's Freedom corrected Dr. Geisler's error at this point. But as I've said many times, Dr. Geisler does not believe that anyone younger than him can point out that he has made an error, uh, and I do not believe that Dr. Geisler has ever read the Potter's Freedom. Uh, the appendix found to in the second edition of Chosen But Free was done by his students, uh, undergraduate students at that. I do not believe that Dr. Geiser would believe. I, I th think from his perspective it would be demeaning and inappropriate uh, for him to even deign the existence of my book with um, the time it would take for him to read it. So uh, that's why I hope I never get in the position where I am so wedded to a tradition uh, that I... I just keep repeating a particular falsehood just simply for the sake of repeating a particular falsehood. Now, obviously, you know, Roman Catholics and Muslims and others, when we have a disagreement, take that and say, ah, oh, but, but you keep repeating this. Well, there's a difference between um, a conclusion that I've come to about the, an error in Islam uh, and a simple continued misrepresentation that's just factually wrong. Uh, we do not believe that the Imago Dei is annihilated, wiped out. Uh, what Geisler is doing is he associates the Imago Dei, the image of God, with libertarianism. If you cannot uh, make autonomous free will choices, then you don't have the image of God. Therefore, uh, if you deny autonomy, the autonomy of the human will, you must be denying that man continues to exist in the image of God. Uh, we believe the image of God is marred. The image of God has been lessened uh, by sin, obviously, uh, but that does not mean that it has been uh, destroyed and annihilated. Genesis 1.27 says God created man in his own image. Yes, man fell. Yes, he sinned. Yes, he separated from God. But he separated from God. He still had God's image. Because after the flood, Noah was told, Whoever sheds man's blood, by man shall his blood be shed, for in the image of God made he him. In other words, don't kill an unsaved person because they're still in the image of God. James 3.9 says it's wrong to curse another human being. Yes, yes, I know. All of this is irrelevant. It's a straw man. But again, I play all of it so you can just see, well, you know, how much time is actually spent doing serious exegesis of relevant texts? rather than just simply beating on a dead horse that isn't actually relevant and yet might seem uh, to impress the ignorant person who uh, has never actually talked to someone who is Reformed and therefore just figures, well, if, you know, if Norman Geiser has done such good work on the, uh, uh, in the resurrection or the, the background of the Bible or something like that, then he, he would have to be correct about these things too. See, that's unfortunately uh, how it functions. And I've seen this in the eyes of people. Um, I might be speaking someplace, and, and all of a sudden someone gets the idea that something I just said sounds Calvinistic. And they'll say something like, well, well that's what a Calvinist would say. Well, yes, ma'am, I'm a Reformed Baptist. I am a Calvinist. And you just see all this stuff flooding into their mind. That is, it's, it's prejudice, it's ignorance, but that's where it's come from. And uh, Christians shouldn't have that happening, but uh, it, it does happen a lot. Because they're made in the image of God. So the image of God is effaced in fallen man, but it's not erased. For all practical purposes, the five-point Calvinist says the image of God is erased. False. It's not there. You're so dead that there's no capacity left there to understand or receive the message of God's grace. And as I said last time, when we talk about uh, First, uh, First Corinthians chapter 2, where they do not understand the things of the Spirit of God, we're talking about spiritual apprehension, uh, which results in uh, obedience, which results in a desire to do what is right before God, and that is true. Uh, while the unregenerate man uh, can understand the facts, understand the, the statements of the Bible concerning what the gospel is, in the sense of being able to then embrace that and to... Uh, 
uh, turn from his sin to free himself from slavery. Evidently, what Dr. Geiser believes is that slaves can simply choose to be free. Uh, they can simply, at any point in time, cease being slaves. Now, uh, that may be his understanding of, um, of slavery, but that's not any slave's understanding of slavery. To get the illustration even more clearly, let's look at Genesis chapter 3. In Genesis chapter 3, in the Old Testament, Adam and Eve sinned. And according to the Bible, therefore they became dead in trespass and sins. Seems to me that the best way to understand the Bible is by the Bible. Now, if the moment Adam took the forbidden fruit, someone said, it wasn't the apple on the tree, it was the pear on the ground that got us in trouble. Well, the pear on the ground, Adam and Eve, both partook of the forbidden fruit. In chapter 2 it said, of every tree of the garden you may freely eat, but of the tree of the knowledge of good and evil you shall not eat thereof, for in the day you eat thereof you shall surely die. Now when Adam took the forbidden fruit and Eve took it, they died. They were spiritually dead. Now here's what a spiritual dead person can do. Genesis chapter 3 verse 9. They had already taken it and the Lord God called Adam and said to him, Where are you? So he said, I heard your voice in the garden, and I was afraid because I was naked, and I hid myself. There are several important things about that. Even though Adam was spiritually dead, he could still hear God. Notice he could still understand. He understood what God was saying. Wow. It's, it is difficult sometimes to, but you know what? You know who uses the same kind of, of argumentation is Greg Stafford. Uh, I have, he's, he's put a chapter in uh, his, the new edition of Def Defending Jehovah's Witnesses going after me on the subject of Calvinism. And uh, when, you know, when I have the time uh, to uh, get around to it, uh, I, I will. But um, the same kind of argumentation. You have this unique situation where God walks with the, the first parents, and he speaks to them. And thereby, by extension, you go, well, uh, that means that spiritually dead people can uh, understand anything God has to say, and they can, uh, uh, they can hear God speaking, and, uh, you know, this, uh, this uh, spiritual death thing isn't all that majorly a good deal. Actually, I would like to point out, uh, what does Adam do? Uh, first of all, they hide themselves. Um, they do not seek after God. God has to find them. And they have become uh, humiliated and fearful of their nakedness. They recognize their nakedness. And Adam's going to blame somebody else for his sin. There's all sorts of things that we can derive from the Adam and Eve story. Uh, but to make that normative in the sense that, well, it means everybody can hear God, and everybody can just understand everything the Bible says, is, uh, well... Again, um, here's another wonderful example of what happens when a philosopher tries to be an exegete. And uh, the result is always a mess. So even in our fallen state, the image of God is still in us. Our ability to hear God is still there. Our ability to respond to God is still there, both positively and negatively, respond in rejecting it or respond in accepting it. In fact, in Romans chapter 1, uh, verse 19, it tells us that unsaved people can understand and perceive the truth of God. Take a look at that in Romans chapter 1, beginning with verse 18. For the wrath of God is revealed from heaven against all ungodliness and unrighteousness of men who suppress the truth. They know it, but they're holding it down. Now notice verse 19. Because what may be known of God is manifest in them, for God has shown it to them since the creation of the world. His invisible attributes are, what are the next two words? Clearly seen. Unsaved people who are dead in trespass and sins can clearly see the truth of God revealed in general revelation. And no one is going to argue um, that mankind has clearly perceived and clearly seen the 
attributes of God, which are specifically revealed, that is his divine power and, 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 and Godhead in the King James Version. Uh, but what is the assertion of Paul? And as a result, every single one of them suppress that knowledge. They hold down that knowledge. Now, what Dr. Geisler would like to tell us is, but they can choose not to. That's where Dr. Geisler becomes an eisegete rather than an exegete. But we need to take our break and come back uh, with Dr. Geisler's sermon and the continued interaction thereof on the basis of the biblical text. Here on The Dividing Line, we'll be right back. And welcome back to the dividing line. We are <laughs> we are making Calvinists <laughs> squirm in their seats and and go, well, but 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 not oh no way uh, I could <laughs> I was, turning red over here. I saw you reaching for the microphone, going, wait a minute, I, I, he's using that. Well, we're we're just. <laughs> Just remember when the blood pressure starts rising. Yes, you know, when, when Chosen But Free came out, first thought across my mind was, oh, the, the confusion this is going to cause for people and how many people are going to be that, you know, are, are misled and misdirected and, and uh, poisoned to, uh, to the wonderful truths of God's sovereignty and grace and caused to be, uh, you know, remain biblically illiterate, basically, and and so, yeah, you know, I, I worked hard on that book. But, you know, now that it's been uh, almost a decade, uh, coming up on a decade, and I see all of the good that has come, how many, how many people today are Reformed and they are firmly rooted because they came to it through that controversy? They came to it because they, they read Geisler and all of a sudden they start going, wait a minute, wait, wait, wait a minute, that doesn't sound right that why is he using completely different standards of biblical interpretation for this subject than he uses elsewhere and then they they read the potter's freedom and they go whoa oh now i see there's talk about a contrast in how you handle the text of scripture and as a result they're more firmly grounded how many of those uh, uh and i you know i wish i had finished posting all of them i should uh, maybe give it to somebody else to put into a file or something like that. I, it's, it takes time, but those uh, 25th anniversary uh, notes that people were sending in, how many of them had to do with this subject? That they were you know, reading Geisler's book and they saw somebody had responded to it, they saw a link, they followed it up, and the lights come on and um, uh, so on and so forth. So, And one thing led to another. I think this rolled into the uh, Bryson debate The that, that Took place, which rolled into the the BAM debate with uh, you, Hank, and George Bryson. And I can't tell you how many emails, how many phone calls I've gotten from people who were listening to that program. <laughs> and that program, in and of itself, just was a huge wake up call, mm -hmm. turning on the lights for them, realizing the methodologies behind the different approaches to Scripture and the massive amount of philosophy that really does lead. To, to supporting uh, the other system. Well, I, I, we've had people in channel say, you know, I'm reformed today because I was driving down the road listening to that series, yelling at the radio, refute him, refute him. And when he discovered that there wasn't any refutation forthcoming, uh, then it's like, then I need to look into this. And voila, that's, uh, that's what we have. So, you know, just take a few deep breaths as you listen to this. You, you know, you feel badly for the people sitting in the pews there, but you might get a chance to talk to some of them. And now they've heard a bad presentation, you can provide the, uh, the counter, uh, the response, and uh, show how to use the text in a proper way and stuff like that. So... Uh, just just take a few deep breaths, but uh, we have to we have to press. On. So clear is it that they are quote without excuse verse twenty, without excuse. So whatever the Bible means by dead and sin, it does not mean that they do not perceive the truth. It does not mean that now notice when we talk about uh, what it mean, what they the natural man doesn't know or understand, we're talking about spiritual things. What Paul is talking about is the revelation of God's attributes found in the natural realm. He's not talking about the gospel. The gospel is foolishness to the unregenerate man. Um, 
So, uh, again, more equivocation. Regeneration, salvation, equivocation. Here, knows spiritual truths, well, knows the existence of God and suppresses the existence of God. Uh, but the natural revelation does not reveal to you the Trinity or the deity of Christ or uh, justification by grace through faith alone or any of those types of things. They can't understand what God is saying to them. Adam understood it, even though he was dead. Death doesn't mean annihilation. It means separation. Death doesn't mean... We've been going about ten, uh, about five minutes now, uh, actually six minutes now, on a canard. Uh, a misrepresentation of the reformed position. Just, just, just to note it in passing. That the image of God is erased. It means the image of God is effaced. Death doesn't mean, and this is a very important distinction, that they cannot perceive the truth. It means they are unwilling to receive the truth. First Corinthians 2.14 The natural man does not receive. It's the Greek word dekomai, which means welcome. Of course there is no welcome in an unsaved heart for the truth of God, but it doesn't mean he doesn't perceive it. Well, let me just ask a question, uh, Dr. Geisler. If uh, the natural man does not uh, receive, decamai, uh, the things of God, then upon what basis does the natural man then freely repent and believe prior to regeneration? Um, how does he perceive and understand his spiritual state and flee from that? So obviously what he's saying is, well, he receives enough of the things of God to recognize his spiritual state and to flee therefrom. That would that'd be the only way uh, that that would make any sense at, at that point. He perceives it very clearly, and he's eternally condemned for rejecting it. What he needs to do is to receive it. While he understands it in his mind, he is not willing to believe it in his heart. So that's the first reason okay if he's unwilling to believe it in his heart what makes him willing uh, maybe we'll get a prevenient grace idea something like that but remember as long as there is no specific personal decree of salvation then you're limited to this idea that god's grace tries to save and it tries to save everyone equally but whether it fails or succeeds is all dependent upon man and you are left with the untenable result uh, that, once again, you have to say, well, um, I was just more sensitive to the Spirit of God. I, I was just more aware of the Spirit of God. I, 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 was, I didn't you know, uh, suppress the truth of God uh, as much. And uh, that leads inevitably to a, uh, a contradiction to the doctrine of grace. Why I am not a five-point Calvinist? Because when they get the card before the horse, you don't get saved in order to believe. You believe in order to get saved. And two, we're not so dead that we can't perceive the truth. We're just so separated from God that we're unwilling to receive the truth. Number two, I'm not a five-point Calvinist because of the you in TULIP. T, total depravity, U, unconditional election. Anyone who reads the Bible seriously knows that the Bible teaches that God has elected us. Let's take a look at Ephesians chapter 1, for example. In Ephesians chapter 1, the Apostle Paul uh, writes to the church at Ephesus, and he says to them in uh, verse 3, Blessed be the God and Father of our Lord Jesus Christ, who has blessed us with every spiritual blessing in heavenly places in Christ, just as he chose us in him before the foundation of the world, that we should be holy and without blame. Verse 5, having predestined us according to the adoption as sons by Jesus Christ to himself, according to the good pleasure of his will. Romans 8 says, whom he foreknew, he predestined. First uh, Peter 1, 2, he says, elect according to the foreknowledge of God. The Bible says 
that even Christ was set aside as the Lamb before the foundation of the world. Revelation 13 and verse 8. That God, by his predeterminate uh, foreknowledge in Acts chapter 2, determined that Christ would die for our sins. Of course, the Bible teaches election. Absolutely, the Bible teaches uh, predestination. But here's the difference between an extreme Calvinist extreme. and a more moderate view. Moderate. The difference between what's traditionally called a five-point Calvinist and what the Bible teaches. The five-point Calvinist says that election is unconditional on God's part. There is no condition for giving it, and there is no condition for receiving it. The moderate view says there is no condition for God giving it. It's given by grace. But no condition for God giving it. It's given by grace. But there's one condition for receiving it, and it's called faith. Now, of course, uh, what this is is another illustration of... Uh, an attitude that I, I found amazing uh, in Dr. Geisler, and, and that is that he feels he can redefine the categories of this uh, centuries-old discussion, uh, evidently just based upon his, his own authority. Uh, I had always detected that uh, in Dr. Geisler's comments on this subject, but uh, I, I didn't really fully realize uh, the fact that he really does think that he has the authority to do so. Uh, until uh, what happened after uh, the book came out and, and uh, the Paris Freedom came out. And in talking with someone who had spoken with Dr. Geisler, and where Dr. Geisler had engaged in a fairly lengthy, uh, rancorous denunciation of yours truly, uh, that one of the things that he said uh, was that um, I had stuck my nose in some place it didn't belong. This was between he and R.C. Sproul. Now, the fact that anyone could possibly think that something as important as a discussion of the very nature of God's work of salvation is between himself and someone else, no matter how popular or big their names might be, is absolutely shocking to me. And what it confirmed was that, obviously, chosen but free uh, was meant to be a rebuttal to chosen by God. Uh, I had, of course, recognized the similarities of the names, but in my naivete, uh, had not believed that um, uh, Dr. Geiser would hold the idea that such things as the very freedom of God and salvation could in some way be boiled down to a uh, fight between uh, major theologians of the uh, late 20th century at that point, and... Uh, uh, I was, uh, as I said, disabused of my naivete at a later point in time. Um, so it, it does strike me as, as um, uh, just really out of bounds uh, for anyone to take the terms in which this discussion has uh, taken place and redefine them. Unconditional election means that God's choice of us as individuals. Remember Ephesians 1, he chose us. Not he chose a class, not he chose a group, not he chose that if you believe in him that this is what's going to happen to you. The direct object of the verb choose is us. It's personal. And if you can't deal with that, then you're not dealing with the Bible. Just admit you don't like what the Bible teaches about this and, and just, just go from there. Say, I'm, I'm not going to accept this. I'm going to replace my philosophical system with this. I'm just going to, I don't want to go there. It says he chose us. Not a plan. doesn't say he chose Jesus. If you believe in Jesus, you get into Jesus, then you get chosen. That's not what it says. He chose us in him. The direct object is us. The realm of that choosing is in Christ. There's no, no one who is ever saved outside of Christ. There's no question about all those things, but he chose us. And the assertion is the whole point of unconditional election is that he does not choose us based upon the fulfillment of conditions. He does not look down the corridors of time and see, ah, I see those who are going to believe in me, and so on the basis of their actions, I will accept them. So unconditional election is simply the assertion that the gracious election of any individual is just that, gracious 
It is free. It is based upon the kind intention of his will, not the kind intention of my will. And so to redefine it the way that Dr. Geiser did in Chosen But Free and in this sermon, to where, well, you know, the moderate Calvinist, i.e. Arminian, believes that we are chosen, um, God chooses freely to ordain that anyone who believes in Jesus will be saved. Now, what is the direct object of that choosing? A plan. It's an impersonal thing. The direct object in Ephesians 1 is personal. It's us. But the moderate Calvinist believes that there is a condition on the part of man and it's faith. And, of course, autonomous faith. Faith that is the result of an autonomous free will uh, that is not acting in accordance to God's decree. That's not moderate Calvinism. That is Arminianism, of course. And so to... To confuse people, to change the very parameters of the discussion, and not explain to people you're doing that. At least if you're going to do that, come out and say, you know what? I think that we've been missing the point of this all along. Here's what people have always said about this, but I think we need to change the parameters. Okay, that's one thing. But to call Arminianism moderate Calvinism is simply to uh, appropriate a term to yourself that isn't yours. You reject Calvinism, fine, reject it. Just be open about it. Don't, don't play around with the, with the words because I don't think it shows a lot of respect uh, for uh, others who you will confuse in the process. Let me illustrate the difference between that five-point view and what the Bible teaches. The five-point view says God from all eternity decided who would be saved and he selected only some even though they were unwilling, even though they were rebellious, and he regenerated them independent of their faith. They couldn't believe, they wouldn't believe, and he uh, regenerated them and saved them apart from and in spite of uh, their act of uh, choosing or rejecting this message. Now... I would agree almost with everything that was said there, except that he confused, confused the time tenses. It almost sounded like there he was saying that from eternity past, they were regenerated, which, of course, they were not. Uh, we are not born justified. The certainty of God's decree does not change the reality of the temporal nature of our existence. When God chooses at a point in time, according to his good pleasure, to break into a person's life and bring them to spiritual life, uh, he can do so. But prior to that time, they were not justified. The certainty of their salvation is, is, is there, no question about that, but we experience life in time. And so it almost sounded, and maybe it was just a slip of the tongue or, or whatever it might be, but it almost sounded like he was in essence saying, uh, that all of this had happened in, in eternity past. And that's, that, of course, not the position that is being uh, presented. That's not what the Bible says. The Bible says, and I'd like you to notice two very important verses. One is found in Romans chapter 8, where it uses the word predestined. Romans chapter 8 and verse 29, right after that famous verse, and we know all things work together uh, for good for those who love God. Verse 29, Romans 8. For whom he foreknew, he also predestined. God foreknew the people that were predestined. Now, keep that in mind and flip over to 1 Peter chapter 1 and verse 2. 1 Peter chapter 1, verse 2. Elect according to the foreknowledge of God. The extreme view says that God chooses some people to be saved apart from his foreknowledge of who will believe. And the moderate view says God chooses in accordance with his foreknowledge of who would believe. So, in other words, uh, again... Arminians believe that God is not the one who initiates salvation. 
in the sense that his election is based upon knowledge of future events. So man becomes the one who determines whether he's going to be saved or not. Now, of course, Romans 8, uh, the term to foreknow is an active verb. It's something that God does. It's not passively taking in knowledge of future events. And election according to foreknowledge does not mean that the foreknowledge precedes the act of election. It means it is in perfect harmony with. And so Geiser is going to, without proving it, assert that the act of foreknowing is a passive taking in of knowledge on God's part. That means God gets to learn things, new things that he, uh, he experiences, I guess. Now, that doesn't fit with his theology, and I had to spend quite some time explaining his determinately foreknowing and foreknowingly determining um, concepts in the book, which he's rather unique in presenting and which doesn't actually answer anything. It doesn't actually accomplish anything. It is just a fancy way of defending libertarianism. But the, the, re the reality is that in the New Testament, when God foreknows, the verb, when God's the subject and he's the one doing the foreknowing, the object is never the actions of man, whether they are going to believe or not believe, do this or do, do that or anything. Uh, that That's not what foreknowing means. The action, the the direct object of God's foreknowing is always persons. So it's a relationship term. It is not a uh, Western uh, taking in of knowledge concept. It is a personal action on God's part relating to persons. And is that going to be discussed? Well, uh, we'll find out, but uh, probably not. In other words... Does God just pick out people in spite of the fact that they're going to believe or disbelieve? In spite of the fact? No. From the Reformed perspective, no one is going to believe because they are slaves of sin and are incapable of doing so because that's what the Scriptures teach in Romans 8 and John 6 and John 8 and so on and so forth. So, no, it's not of in spite of. It is... All acts of grace are in spite of our being rebel sinners. Uh, you, you would think that would be a given. Or does he choose people knowing that they will receive the message of salvation? Now notice, knowing that. In other words, God's election becomes secondary to human action. God's choosing is not actually choosing anything. Uh, that would be like, um, I'm going to go to lunch with my uh, my daughter here because I'm going to be heading out of town. I haven't hardly even seen her for ages. And um, that, that would be like saying that the folks at the restaurant will choose what I'm going to eat today. And then when they tell me, I'll go, okay, I'll choose that. Uh, how much of a, of a relevant choice is that? It isn't. Uh, it, it reduces God's choice, his election to merely ratifying what the creature has done freely in and of himself based upon passively taking in knowledge. And that simply isn't the God of the Bible. It is the God of the philosophers, but it is not the God of the Bible. So we will continue. I don't know about what the future holds as far as dividing lines. I'm going to be traveling. Uh, but I've got my EEE PC and uh, it's possible that we might be able to do something. We'll see. Uh, it's sometimes hard to tell what, you know, if you've got good reception, bad reception, stuff like that. But uh, we'll try to let you know on the blog what we try to figure out. Appreciate you listening today. Uh, we will we will be live streaming the dialogue with Shamsi Ali, however, uh, on Thursday, a week from today. So uh, we'll be putting that in the blog, too. Thanks for listening. God bless.